In our first section, we uh, became friends again with the quadratic equation and the quadratic formula. Something that, as long as you, it's not been too long since you've been in school, has been indelibly burned into your brains, no doubt. And in the last episode, we, we sort of went through what you do in school. If you've got a quadratic equation, you learn the quadratic formula, you plug it in, you get some answers. As long as you don't think too hard about what those answers mean, everything's fine. Uh, and then in, in this section, what I'd like to do is to spend a little bit of time thinking about why the quadratic formula actually works, why it gives you the answer. From knowing what we know about the, the game of algebra, this should be simple. We should be able to take this equation, this is the quadratic equation, and do some stuff to it that's legal in the world of equations, you know, dividing through by things, moving things over, blah, 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 and eventually end up with x by itself on one side of the equation, a solved equation for x. So that should work, right? Anything that doesn't change the truth value of the equation, we should be allowed to do. But unlike the equation we solved last time, it's not really clear how to go from point A to point B this time. I want you to pause here, though, and try on your own. I don't necessarily expect you to get there, but I want you to see why it's hard. If you do get there, though, good on you. So really, like, pause here, take a minute, and try and get from there to there. Okay, did you do it? Are you frustrated yet? Good. What makes this hard is that you're stuck trying to take a square root of something that you can't later extract. So, you know, where, what do you do with this thing? If you put it over there and try and take a square root, then you've got the x under the square root. If you leave it over here, you've got a bunch of stuff under the square root you can't do anything with. All right, so I'm going to show you the way out of this trouble. Let's continue. See. In school, you're usually only asked to solve equations by algebra using moves that are fairly obvious. To solve this one, you'd have to be pretty inventive and be willing to go out on a limb before you knew if something was working. So I'd like to show you how, to, how that's done. First though, there's something that's obvious to do to help. No one likes equations where a doesn't equal one. And it's really easy to turn any equation that has an a that's not one into one where a is one. All we have to do is just divide everything by a. Watch. Okay, <laughs> easy enough, right? But we'll actually carry it through. So this is ax squared over a plus bx over a plus c over a equals zero over a, which is zero. And then those two a's cancel out and then get x squared plus, and what I'm gonna do is write the constant parts together. So this turns into x squared plus b over ax plus c over a equals zero. And now I've got an equation where this first term, the term, the coefficient in front of the x squared is just equal to one. That's the nice easy case. Uh, the next thing that helps is having some familiarity with a process that's the opposite of what you're trying to do, meaning squaring instead of square rooting. And so I want to show you a basic fact in algebra. And more than one mathematician has told me that if they were going to give a one question algebra test, this would be that one question. So the, the most basic thing to see if people understand the game of algebra. And it's this. This would be the question. And then the correct answer. Some people say that the reason why this works is something called foiling. First, outside, inside, last. Others are pedantic and refuse to call it anything other than a distributive property. Regardless of what you call it though, this situation comes up time and time again and is just what we mean when we're talking about multiplication and addition being mixed together. The specific form here even has a name. It's called sum of squares. So let me talk a little bit about sum of squares as a preface to showing why the quadratic formula works. I don't want this to feel like an infinite regress where to show how one thing works, we gotta show how another works and then it's just turtles all the way down. But maybe it's worth just a minute here to see why we might believe something like this. I know you've, you've likely been told this and would write it down on a test, but why do you believe this? Historically and pedagogically, algebra comes from geometry. And the most basic metaphor that includes multiplication and addition together involves the sides and areas of rectangles. If A and B each measure lengths, 
then adding lengths together means adding A to B, something like this. So if I've got a length that's A and I've got a small length that's B, then A plus B is what I get when I stick those two things together. Don't mind that my lines aren't actually the same length. This is math, the art of bad drawings. So you are looking live at A plus B right now. Then where does multiplication come from? A squared is the square you get from A. Again, don't worry if these drawings aren't to scale. If you are worried, draw better drawings than me, I guess. So B squared is something with the side of B in two dimensions. And in general, to make a rectangle out of A plus B, and make another rectangle. And maybe I'll even mark where A is and where B is. So all together, this is A plus B. So then if I do the same thing, where this part is A, and this part is B, and this whole thing is A plus B, I complete this picture, I follow these little hatch marks into full-blown lines, then look, this square right here is A squared, this little square right here has height B and width B, so that's B squared, and then this is A by B, so this rectangle has area AB, this rectangle has area AB, and if I think about this drawing in the right way, I'm looking live at a proof of this algebraic identity. In fact, writing out this algebraic identity can be also written out as x squared equals sum of its parts. The whole square is literally the sign a plus b squared, a square made out of a plus b. And if I look at each of its individual parts, one of those parts is a squared, another part is b squared, and then I have two parts that are each a, b. And this is actually going to end up being the secret to why the quadratic formula works. Have you seen that before? Seen that before? If not, take a minute with it. A lot of people feel a big release when they see that this abstract seemingly arbitrary fact that they've been asked to memorize turns out to follow immediately from a simple drawing. It can give you a feeling that algebra can be about something concrete, that it describes real things rather than just making up and following arbitrary rules. Whether this drawing though is, is like a proof or an answer to why the algebraic identity is true, well, that gets a little bit more complicated. This has sometimes been the case and other times it's really not. In general, the relationship between geometry, arithmetic, and algebra is long and varied. Let's take a quick historical digression though to see where this idea comes from. It is true that this fact comes from this picture, even though now things are maybe a little bit more mixed up. 